Welcome to Our Last Meal, the podcast on grief, loss, and food. I'm your host, Andrew, and in every episode I talk with a guest about someone important in their life, someone they've lost, and what role food played in their relationship. This week I'm sharing a conversation I had with Nikki. Nikki is an end of life doula and grief coach based out of Ohio. This was a really interesting conversation even outside of the normal conversation about her own personal experiences with the loss and grief, but her talking about the work that she does as an end-of-life doula. This isn't a profession I even knew about until recently, and I just want to say thank you to people like her that are doing this work and being with people in their final moments and making sure that, you know, there is comfort for those that are leaving and their families are leaving behind. I do want to say before we go into the topic, uh, this show does contain talk of death, so please be mindful as you listen. I hope you enjoy the conversation. I hope that it is in some way informative, and let's go ahead and jump right into the show. Hello and welcome to our last mail. I'm your host, Andrew, and my guest this week is host of the podcast, Good Grief, Nikki the Death Doula. Nikki, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. I, it is a pleasure. Um, I was telling you before we got started that uh, it, it is it really is an honor to have you on just because I really do admire the work you do. I think thank it you. is important, and I'm just happy you would take the time to come talk with me. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's an honor to do what I do. Uh, it's It's an intimate part of somebody's life when they're dying and to have them invite a stranger and to be part of that. It's an honor for me to be, yeah. you know, to be part of that and to help usher them into whatever comes next. Yeah. And I know we're basically going to go zero to 60 here, but um, <laughs> for anyone who maybe is not familiar, familiar with what a death doula is or what you do, mm -hmm. can you share a little more about that? Absolutely. Uh, my 30 second pitch. <laughs> um, <laughs> basically, I provide spiritual and emotional support to the dying and to their families. So I, my goal, my every death doula is a little bit different, but we can manage things like helping sure hospice is set up, make sure the family understands what's going to be happening as the person is dying and make sure the person understands what's going to be happening as they're dying and that they're comfortable with it. But my, my goal, what I try to focus on the most with my clients is making sure they feel their life meaning. So yeah. when they pass, they can pass peacefully and without any, you know, unfinished business or feeling like they have a lot of regrets, I want to make sure they they die knowing that they meant something to this world and that they were important. Because the thought of anybody dying and thinking that their life had no meaning and their life had no impact on this world as a whole, it, it breaks my heart. So that's that's my biggest goal is to make sure people can leave this world understanding that they meant something. That is... I know it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's that's um, that's one of those. It, it's it's it takes a moment to sit with, right? Yeah, absolutely. And because... it's it sounds beautiful, and it's a lovely thing. And I, not all deaths go wonderfully. Yeah. You know, not all deaths go to plan. Um, and some people still do leave this world feeling unaccomplished. So it, it happens. It's sad, but it happens. The fact though. You know, I have to, and this could be the eternal optimist in me, but I have to hope that even in that situation, knowing that somebody's beside of them who wants them to see the, the positive or see mm -hmm. that, you know, even in, what is it, 8 billion people on this planet now, I mean, yeah. you, know, you, you matter and you mean something. Yeah, yeah. And there are so many, if I could, <laughs> my other, my other big ax to grind is there are just so many people out there that die with nobody. Um, I've heard so many horror stories, especially people in the LGBTQ plus community who are um, thrown aside by their family They're, and they have no one. They may have friends, they may have a support group, but otherwise they have no family to be there. And I can't bear the thought of somebody dying, feeling they're completely alone in this world. So if I can just be that one person to hold their hand and let them know that they're not alone, that's, that's, a, that's an honor for me, yeah. um, let alone a comfort for them. Uh, you know, and you know, you mentioned that community specifically, and that that is so heartbreaking to me. Mm -hmm. um, this is, and you know, this isn't the topic of the show, but I think this yeah. is a, this is a good kind of a, this is a rabbit hole I'm comfortable going down. Is that yeah, 
to think, you know, to think that there is somebody who could disown their child for something. Yeah. Like that. I, I don't, I told you before we started, I'm a father and I could not fathom that. Right. I, I don't, I don't have children, but I, I can't fathom that. I, no. I just, I don't understand it at all. I, um, I've told my wife before our daughter, if she were a cannibal, I would probably try to find a way to justify, well, okay, but she probably <laughs> had a good reason. <sighs> I couldn't fathom like, and that, please, I'm not comparing, <laughs> I'm not comparing a community to cannibals. What I'm saying right, is right. there is literally nothing that could, my child could do to make me not love her. Yeah, And exactly. to just want nothing to do with her. So in that situation, yeah. I don't understand that. I don't, and I met, uh, there's a couple of, well, a lot of people I met in my training to become a doula. And uh, there was one specific lady who's one of the trainers through um, where I got my training through. It's a, the International End of Life Doula Association, Enelda for short. Um, and she became a doula. She started out, she was working in hospice in the 80s, late 70s, early 80s when the AIDS crisis was starting. And she had so many friends and people that she saw that much like, you know, I, I mentioned earlier with the LGBTQ plus community that were just shunned by everybody because they had AIDS and yeah. they were, they were dying scared and alone. So she, and she was like, I don't care who you are, what you've done. You're a human being and I'm going to sit with you and hold your hand. So you're not alone when you die. And that was just hearing her talk about these stories was, I cried for days. It was just so beautiful. You know, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because, um, as you were, as you were talking specifically, I thought of, um, it, and it's possible it was the same woman. Um, there was a woman who I heard about through another podcast I listened to, and I, I don't remember the name of the show, and I don't remember the woman's name, but it was that same scenario mm -hmm. in the 80s during the AIDS epidemic. I mean, when it was really bad, mm -hmm. and you had all these people that were just dying with no yeah. one that she yeah. would be there for them. Right. And this, unfortunately, although there wasn't much anybody can do at this point, but COVID, there were people yeah. dying alone in hallways you know, because the, the hospitals were overrun with, with people with COVID and there was not enough staff and we didn't know anything. We knew way nothing at that time, you know, as far as how contagious it was and what it was going to do to people. So they just had people lined up in hallways on gurneys dying by themselves. Yeah. I, I heard so many horror stories during COVID of people, you know, that to your point, dying without being able to see their family, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, maybe being able to FaceTime. And then the mm -hmm. ones who, you know, insisted, I want to be with family, you know, more people getting sick and more people yeah. dying. And yeah, it's, I'm just going to say it. the last few years have been really hard, I think. Uh, yeah. On society as a whole. And I know that's yeah. <laughs> understatement of the century. That's I'm right. Not anything profound. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's yeah. Very much so. It just, I don't, do you ever get the sense that it's in the face of all the insanity that it just feels like, you know, collectively we've all just said like, Oh, this, is, this whole thing's weird. And we just kept moving and we never really stopped to to talk about it or to think about it. Like, you know, yeah. in, a, in an emotionally intelligent way. Yeah, absolutely. I, and especially the beginning in the first year or so, I feel like we were just so focused on dealing with what this was and what it was going to do to us like physically, but also, you know, economically and everything like, what does this mean? How, what is the world going to look like next year that we didn't even think about discussing? How is this affecting us emotionally? Yeah. And, you know, as we started to quote, come out of this, when we started going back out into public again, there were a lot of people that were traumatized and they either, even just from being stuck at home, you know, not necessarily if they lost anybody, but some people lost family and friends, but they were, and they were stuck at home alone, you know, for yeah. a year or more and it affected them. It traumatized them. And we, I feel like we're still not dealing with that. I agree. I, um, I spoke with, a. Uh... You know, the, the there's a podcast, the Mashup Americans, and they were on several episodes ago, and they did they did a series on their show called Grief Collective, and that was a big central theme of it was this collective sense of grief that we need to tackle as a society, and they you know they really tied in how COVID played a big part in that, and mm -hmm. I, I you know I'll plug that again that that was a really fascinating listen just because they they talked about how this this concept of grief in the West, we don't tackle it head on. No. And then we've been through this major event, 
these last right? few years and just haven't. And we're still not dealing. We're still not talking about it. Yeah. We, we still use it as a, as a point to argue, not as a point to come together. Yeah. Yep. This is probably the, the most somber start to one of these episodes <laughs> oh, <no>. ever. But <laughs> I'm sorry. No, 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 no. That's, that's fine. Because I mean, I, I, I tell people and I, I firmly believe, you know, grief is processed differently by everyone. And I'm sure yeah. you've seen this. And Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I don't think there's one right or wrong way to do it. So I know yeah. I've had guests come on and it's, it's nothing but laughs. I've had some that come on and it's a little more emotional. Every conversation is different. Yeah. But I, I appreciate that we've been able to just kind of jump right, <laughs> jump right into it. Well, I can tell you a funny story if you want about death and grief. <laughs> I'll never say no to a funny story. <laughs> um, spoiler alert, uh, my brother died in uh, 2015 and we had him cremated and we were, you know, a year later when we, the headstone was finished at his uh, plot. We have a family plot now in the cemetery. It was about a year later when all that was ready and we were taking his ashes to the the cemetery to put in the, um, in the headstone and on the drive over, it was just my parents and me in the back seat. And I had the urn next to me and I kept scooting it over. I'm like, mom, Scott's on my side of the car. <laughs> and my, thank God they had a good sense of humor. Cause my dad turned around and said, I will turn this car around and we'll go home. <laughs> Cause that, that is the spirit of our entire childhood. <laughs> I, um, and I'll say this, if anyone's listening and you, you can't laugh at that, I, I'm <laughs> not going to judge human. you. I, I just, every, like I said, everyone processes differently. Mm-hmm. I know my family, anytime we've ever, I remember one of the, the best Christmases with my immediate family I can remember was about a decade or so ago. My mom had a health issue and we spent it at the hospital. We spent Christmas Eve. It was my mom, my dad, Aww. my sister and me. My brother wasn't there and she, she's okay. But Christmas Eve and we're sitting at the hospital and in the span of an, a couple hours, we went from panicked about what was going on to her to we're just all sitting in this little waiting room, cracking up, making jokes. Mm-hmm. Everybody processes it differently, but I mean, oh, yeah. I think humor is a really effective way to to handle these things. Absolutely. I actually, my we had to take my brother to the emergency room on Christmas day once years. I think it was the Christmas right before he passed away. Um, we had to take him to the emergency room and he was in the hospital then for quite a while. But, uh, you know, we were all nervous and we were sitting in the hospital waiting for him. And I went back to see him and I was like, hey, wait, we're on Christmas. <laughs> I mean... But see right there, that, the <laughs> fact that you had that relationship and, and even in the, the ride to the, to the cemetery, the fact that, you know, you, I can understand why you would use humor to kind of, mm-hmm. it, it's a terrible, it's a shitty situation. We'll, we'll it call is. it what it is. It is. And I don't know, sometimes humor just, do you feel like humor for you is a natural reflex? Uh, yeah. So I have a, I actually, my theater, my degree in college was in theater. So I have a long history in comedy, theater and improv. So yes. <laughs> You could say so. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but think about it. Okay, so whenever you were going through that, mm-hmm. um, you, did you did was that sense of humor? I'm just, I'm sure it wasn't just a year later that it finally popped up. But was it something that helped you process your own grief? Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, don't get me wrong. There were days where I cried my eyes out. You know, I lost. He was my only brother. He's my only sibling. So yeah. um, it was obviously that was tr- hard and traumatic for me. Um, so I had days where it was just impossible. It felt like it was impossible to move forward. But I mean, two days after he died, I cracked jokes, you know, like no small ones. But and obviously, as time went on, it was easier to, to make those jokes. But yeah, yeah. it's one of those. Um, it's, it's when you lose someone. People, I think people sometimes will try to tell you it gets better. It's not that it gets better. It's just that it gets not quite as bad. Yeah, it gets different. That's the way it to gets, put it. That's that's the way I try to explain it to my clients. Like it, it you can't say it gets better, but it gets different. Yeah. It's like you never get over grief. That's I. That's the hardest thing I can tell anybody, but it's true. You're never going to get over your grief. It just changes, and you learn to live with it. And when you see this, that right there is why I wanted to do this show is, is trying to understand and talk about grief more and better. And mm-hmm. and I told you before we started that 
a big driver is that we, we don't have these conversations, mm -hmm. you know, um, when we, I, I've, I've shared before with other people that to me, whenever I've lost a loved one, it feels like there's this sense of otherness about me. And I, I know that it's a thing. It's not a rational thing. It's an in my head thing. Mm -hmm. I lost my grandmother a few months ago and in the immediate days afterwards, you know, it's just, you just, it just feels like there's this, this, this stink on you or this thing on you. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it just, it feels like, okay, everyone can tell that. I'm off or that I'm just something's yeah. wrong yeah. and I'm, I'm killing the mood, I guess is how yeah. I put it. But I mean, I, I went through a lot of that after my brother passed because I'm always the goofy one in the room with the sense of humor and, you know, cracking the jokes. And I would have people like, what's, what's wrong? You're not you. You're like all, you look sad. Yeah. And I'd have to tell people when well, my brother died. Oh, <laughs> I, I hope for everyone around you that nobody, and this is why I'll never make this joke is that, Oh, who died? I will never. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Mm, I, I've a long time back. I remember making that joke once and somebody had died and I was like a teenager at the time. I felt like a, a real a-hole for, I still feel like an a-hole. And that was like 30 some years ago. And I'm like, Oh, remember that time? I was like, who died? And somebody's like, my mom just died. I'm like, Oh, I, we have to forgive ourselves for the things we do as teenagers. Yeah. Oh, I know. I was we, a two. I, I think we were all different people back then. <laughs> I, I know. I would not like my. If I met my teenage self now, I would not like him. I would think he was mm -hmm. wildly immature, and yeah. just annoying. Um, oh yeah. Me. Same here. I, I was very emo. <laughs> I was a little uh, dramatic and emo, and oh god, I still apologize to my mother every time I see her. <laughs> I. It's, I, know, I know that feeling though of you know just that thing that pops in your head. It's like okay, I'm about to go to sleep. I'm tired. I want to get a good night's rest. Oh, you remember that thing you did 20 years ago? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Think about that for the next three hours while you stare. <laughs> <at the sun. laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But no, I mean, I I I think humor can be an effective way to, I guess, process. Uh, but yeah, it's I know there's a range of emotions. Mm -hmm. Um, so you know, you you mentioned your brother. Would you tell me about him? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so he was, was, I, was I, I still struggle with the was, is thing. Uh, he, three years my senior, so he was the older brother. Um, and I, I joked about us arguing a lot. We, we fought all the time as kids. We were very different. So plus brother, sister, it seems to be kind of normal, yeah. I guess. But uh, we were very different people. So we, we, darn near killed each other when we were growing up and my mom would have to physically separate us on the regular. Um, and he was, he was the kind of older brother that would like sit on my head and fart, uh, <laughs> hold me upside down by my ankles and shake me and be like, say you like it. I'll put you down. And, you know, like that kind of crap. Yeah. Um, you know, the usual sibling, I don't, maybe other yeah. siblings don't do that, but we sure did. <laughs> well, my, I have an older brother and sister who um, I, I vividly remember being stuck into a tuba case. I remember. Oh being God. A, yeah, no. And I wish I could say that was it. I also remember being put in a, in a gym bag and I know, I know at one point I was on the top bunk and then at one point I was on the floor. Oh, I don't no. know from how high I was dropped and I don't know if that's why I am the way I am now, but oh. <laughs> No, oh, no judgments. What I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah. No, we, yeah, we argued a lot. We fought a lot. Um, but I feel like you know most people. As we got older, we got past that. You know, we were able to be civil with each other. Um, yeah, he was. Uh, he went to school. He really wanted to be an architect. I remember that when he was young. He just he even got a draftsman's table in the basement, and then like he would do these amazing renderings of buildings. Um, but he just couldn't, couldn't get through school. Uh, he had pretty severe social anxiety. Mm. <clears throat> so he had a hard time working with other people. Um, so he ended up dropping out of college. He just had office jobs after that. And I always felt a little sad because I felt like he would have been really good at that. His other passion was nature. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, he was, he grew up as, he was a boy scout. Uh, my dad was in the scouts. He was in the scouts and he had dreams at one point of being a, a forest ranger too. He thought that would be fun, but no. he just, he had a love of hiking of nature, camping, um, and animals. He just, he loved animals and 
yeah, he, none of that came to fruition for him. And I always felt a little bad, but he did the classic married his high school sweetheart to have the two kids in the house with the white picket fence and all that. So, yeah. you know, and I love him and appreciate him to this day for having children so that my mom got her grandchild fix and <laughs> I didn't have to do it. <laughs> he took one for the team. <clears throat> yes, he did. Thank you so much, Scott. So yeah, I have a, a niece and a nephew from this and they are two beautiful human beings. That's, yeah. I, I'll say this, the, um, I'll circle back the social anxiety thing that you mentioned that mm -hmm. I don't think, a, I think anyone who, who doesn't understand how difficult that is, is either you've never dealt with anxiety mm -hmm. or love someone who did. And I don't say that in an act, I'm going to, I'm not going to try to say it because I'm mispronounced, but I'm not trying to accuse anyone when I say that. I'm just trying to say it is, a, it is a really difficult thing yes. to deal with. And it is so hard to verbalize like mm -hmm. what it is and how it makes somebody feel. I just, I sympathize, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. That, yeah. You know, but I mean that it, it does still sound like he was able to accomplish a lot. Yeah. You know, absolutely. even in spite of that. Yeah. He was, he was a, an amazing father. He loved his kids. He loved his kids fiercely. Um, he loved OSU football. We're in Columbus, Ohio. So <laughs> I was, a, if you live here, you have to love the Buckeyes, I guess. I don't know. I'm not really a football person, but <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, he loved his OSU football, loved his kids and he was, he was a good man. He was a very good man. Yeah. Now, um, his kids, um, are you still able to maintain a close relationship with them? Yes, absolutely. Uh, my niece lives down in Cincinnati now. She just got married this past summer. Wow. I know. Uh, she, oh God, she, her name's Allie and she's just the most beautiful girl. I, I'm probably biased, but she's just the most beautiful girl. She <laughs> killed us all. Her mom walked her down the aisle, but she showed us late. I had to wait. Thankfully, she waited till after the ceremony to show us her bouquet had a picture of my brother, her dad, so oh, that he man. could, well, I know, so that he could walk her down the aisle and she showed it to us and me and my mom, my dad just burst into tears. We're just like ugly crying. <laughs> She's yeah. like, I'm sorry. We're like, no, it's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. So she's graduated college. She's living a dream now. And my nephew is here in Columbus with me. His name's Levi. And he is, He's finding his way. He's just out of high school. So he's, he's in that stage where he's got to find it. He's finding his way and that's fine. It all takes yeah. his time. When well, that goes back to being a teenager, there's no, oh, yeah. don't, you know, don't lose a limb. Don't hurt anyone else <laughs> outside of that. You'll, you'll probably be able to figure it out. Yeah. You know. yeah. Make sure the I damage just... isn't too severe and you should be okay. Yeah. I hate how much pressure we put on 18 year olds to sort out your whole daggone life right now. Like, I didn't get my life sorted out. I still don't quite have it sorted out. I'm 45. So, yeah. you know, like putting that on an 18 year old, your prefrontal cortex isn't fully formed yet. Give them some yeah. time. So That's, you're right though. And it's, it's, I, you know, my, my, my daughter is six. And so I, I love the fact that she's still on a week to week basis. What she wants to be changes. Mm -hmm. She's told me that she wanted to be a ballerina slash firefighter. Oh my God. Not one beautiful. or the other, but both. So both, yes. Are, oh yeah. You know, fighting fires by day, nutcracker by night. Oh um, my God. Today she wanted, told me she wanted to be a veterinarian. So, but I, I love that. Like we, we, we should encourage mm -hmm. more of that. Like there are oh, yeah. so many different options. And the thing is you don't know most of them. No. I, and I'm like you, I'm, I'm 35. I've, I've, I've told my wife, I've got another 30 years. I have to work at least. Yeah. I hope I get to try a bunch of different things before it's all said yeah. and done. I, I didn't know I wanted to be a death doula until about two, three years ago. So yeah. here I am. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the great thing about life is, I mean, there's so much capacity to learn and to grow yeah. and it's the only thing that's going to limit you is really, you know, I guess your willingness. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I like, I'm kind of a, you know, classic story of midlife crisis. I got to my mid forties and, and then COVID and I was at home with my husband and I'm like, I don't like what I do. <laughs> I don't like any of this. Why am I doing this? So I spent a lot of time in the first year of COVID just really kind of exploring myself and, you know, revisiting my old passion. I've always had a passion to work with the dying um, and I've always felt passionate about it, but it's just one of those things I mean, yeah, but that's not something I'd actually do. Yeah. And I got to this point, I'm like, well, why the heck not? 
Who do said it? <laughs> exactly. It's like I'm 45. I could do whatever the hell. I bought a trampoline for myself for my 42nd birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Like a big 10 footer in the backyard. I'm like, I was not allowed to have this as a child. Damn it. I'm going to get a trampoline. And I did. <laughs> so yeah, that's just been my mentality since I hit my forties. I'm like, I'm just going to do it. Cause why not? Yeah. You know, it's, I like that you said the trampoline. I remember once, um, with some, some roommates I had in college one day we were, I was sitting down, I was looking at, a at an, and one of those papers that you get in the mail that has a, like it was a sales paper for a local store and I'm flipping through it. I saw that they had trampolines. I'm like, why the hell don't I have a trampoline? I've got the space in the backyard. I there's literally there's no one to tell me I can't do this. I ended up I still didn't do it. I, I'm not there's not a happy ending to the story. I didn't go get a oh. trampoline. Oh, go get one but, now. <laughs> well, the thing is, now I'm the parent who's like, I I don't want you jumping on a trampoline. I don't want you to fall. <laughs> no, you're floor. my mom. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's it's really it's that that's a great moment when you realize that I'm an adult. I can I can have ice cream for dinner if I want. There's Mm -hmm. nothing to stop me from ice cream and beer for dinner. Right. But then you're an adult, so you have ice cream and beer for dinner, and you're sick for three days. So there is that. (laughs) It's like, yeah, I I can't sleep wrong, or otherwise I'm going to... If I sleep too aggressively, I'm going to wake up, and I won't be able to move my neck. Yep. Been there. (laughs) uh, When I turned 30, I I joked for a while that that week, I'm like, oh, I'm going to... I'm getting old now. I'm falling apart. You know, ha, ha, ha. Literally the week I turned 30, I woke up one morning. My neck was so stiff, I could not move it more oh, than no. half an inch. And it just, it felt like, okay, universe, I get it. I, I'll chill. I'll, I'll try to watch the jokes. You know, <laughs> I, I definitely got put in my place. The day I sneezed and like tweaked my back, I was like, wow, okay, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> the, I, I remember one night taking off a sock and losing my balance a little bit and like I just had to shift on my foot a little bit and I thought I pulled my arm out of my socket oh god yeah I and my wife is watching this whole thing and I'm just looking at her and I'm thinking we're gonna have to go to the hospital because I just I I just and I I have to come up with an excuse because I can't tell them that I had a a socket I was I was playing racquetball yeah that's it (laughs) I was in the backyard doing my nightly backflips and you know (laughs) must have miscalculated one (laughs) <laughs> yep yeah so it it sounds like you know it sounds like he was a great man um yes very much when you think of him and you think of food you know because i, I th- food is a, a big central theme to this podcast because yeah. I, I really do feel like there are so many foods that we can associate with people we care about mm-hmm. what do you think of when you think of that the first thing i think of is beer cheese um because every year at thanksgiving my mom she would always have the biggest spread of just snacks that we would graze on all day so that we were all full by the time we got to dinner. (laughs) It was just, it was poor planning, but it was, that's how it was every year. But she always made a beer cheese in, uh, she would hollow out one of those big loaves of Hawaiian, the Hawaiian roll bread. Yeah. Hollow that out and put the beer cheese in that. We just dip the bread in it and eat it. And that was my brother's, he would plow through like over half of it. We barely (laughs) got, we'd had to get to it before he did. So we, you know, he wouldn't eat it all. That was his absolute favorite. Um, so I, I continue to make it. I make it myself for Thanksgiving every year now, which we we don't do Thanksgiving anymore because my parents are snowbirds now. Oh, okay. So we celebrate Thanksgiving in early November. We, so it's Thanksgiving, but it's not on Thanksgiving weekend. But yeah, so I still make beer cheese every year for him. kind of in his honor and his memory, but also because I like it too. <laughs> and now I can eat it. <laughs> Well, I was, so I was going to ask when you, when you make it now or when you have it now, do you, are you thinking of him when you, when you have it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, if he didn't love it so much, we probably wouldn't continue to make it every year. And then after yeah. he was gone, I just, I was the one that was thinking, oh, we, we got to make the beer cheese. Right. And I think, I don't remember if it was my mom or my dad, it was probably my mom was like, well, we don't have to. I'm like, yeah, we kind of do. I feel yeah. like we do. So uh, I offered to make it, which I'm a terrible cook, but it's really hard to screw that up. It's three <laughs> ingredients. You can't really mess it up. So um, yeah, so I made it that year and I've been making it every year since. It's it's super simple. It's easy, but it's just one of those things that makes me think of him. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, and so th- this is a theme that I, I, I think about a lot is that when we think of like food, right? We think of, mm-hmm. you know, good food we associate with people we care about. It is so rare that the, I don't think I've had anybody yet who the food they associate with somebody 
is something high end or like, oh, it's it was a seventy dollar steak from a steakhouse. It's always something simple. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, if I think of my grandmother, what I'm thinking of is bologna sandwiches and little Debbie donut sticks. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um we used to we went camping all the time when we were younger. Um that was all our vacations were camping vacations. Like I, yeah. I didn't know that hotels were something normal people could stay in <laughs> until I was like a teenager. Cause we just, so every time we traveled, we'd camp when we got there, like we went to Washington DC, but we went camping in Virginia. Um, but we had all these like foods we made that I still love to this day. And it was just like pork chops on a grill and, yeah, you know, fried potatoes. And my dad would always save the potato grease for the eggs the next morning. And it was so good. Um, but it's just based, yeah, it's, you know, hot dogs and hamburgers. We'd have at cookouts or, you know, like I said, pork chops. My mom would always make like a big batch of fried chicken and stick it in the um, cooler. So we'd have cold fried chicken too. See, and that, again, that goes back to, it's it's not the, the food is part of it. You know, mm-hmm. the, the food is definitely part of it, but it really does come down to the people you shared it with. Absolutely. Absolutely. S'mores are like a religion to me now <laughs> with all the camping we did. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's small, basic foods, but it's, it's what I think of, you know? Yeah. I, I love that you're able to still do that though, to still make those things to, I guess, to help make you feel closer to them and mm-hmm. just still feel that connection. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we used to do a camping, well, we still kind of do, we had a camping trip we would do every single year in October. And I think we started at the year I was born. So it's been going on for well over 40 years. And, uh, it was just, um, my family and one other family and it grew over the years and there'd be like four or five families on this trip every single year. Uh, and then it shrank back down and now it's just me and my parents and, they're like, I don't know if we want to keep doing this. So it might just be me, <laughs> you know, but I can still do that every year and I can still make all the, the s'mores for myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. and that's the thing. I mean, it's, I, I guess that food can, uh, it can help you to fill that empty spot, right? That empty plate. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I love that you're able to keep that going. Yeah. Is this, um, I have to ask, you know, so whenever you're, you're, you're doing your work as a, as a death doula, Mm -hmm. I I assume that there's also working with the families of the person, if their family's still in the picture, Mm -hmm. is that part of it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Do you ever share any of the coping mechanisms that you, you've learned that have helped you with, with them and how they can, I guess, try to enter that grieving process as healthily as possible? Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely can. And I have a client I'm working with right now, actually. And it was more the client, less the family, but she's, she's struggling a lot with being ready. She's ready, but she's not ready, if that makes sense. And she's having a lot of anxiety, which is totally normal, by the way. Yeah. Dying is scary. Um, cause we don't, we've never done it before. <laughs> so, yeah. um, I have been teaching her breathing because she's, she's start to have panic attacks and I've been teaching her the breathing techniques I use for myself when I'm having a panic attack. Um, and but yeah, I've, I've definitely shared some of my own coping mechanisms. It depends on the family too. If it's somebody I know personally, that's a different story. If it's a complete stranger, I, I tend not to put myself into it too much. I want to respect them and do what I think is best for them. I can give them techniques that I know of, or yeah. I can give them techniques that I know I've used that work for me that, but I won't tell them necessarily. This is something I always do. Like maybe we can try this. So, yeah. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. I have to ask too about the, about the work. Does it get easier at any point? Mm. And I know that's a loaded question. Yeah. I mean, yes, but no, because every, every person is different. Every death is going to be different and every grieving process, like you, we already talked about that. Everybody grieves differently. Um, and some people are going to be able to just be like, I'm ready. Let's go. I had a client who was, she called me. She was, I, I had talked with her family prior to, to her, you know, going into hospice and she called me. She's like, I'm ready to die. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I came over, we chatted for a bit. Um, we got set up, got her set up on hospice. And, uh, she was like, I don't want to be, I don't want this to linger. I just want to be gone in a week or two. I was like, well, 
more on your schedule, honey. You <laughs> do what you need to do. And my job was easy because she was so ready and so calm about the whole process. And she died very peacefully. Um, and I've had people that are terrified and they're almost going out kicking and screaming, like yeah. not literally, but figuratively. And so they're all very different. Yeah. So it's it's hard to say if it gets easier, but you do get desensitized to certain things because, I mean, to be blunt, death is icky. Yeah. You know, yeah. icky things happen. And it gets, those things get a little bit easier after you've experienced that or, you know, witnessed it more than once. So. Yeah. I, um, you know, I, I told you one of the, you know, one of the reasons I have so much respect for what you do is, you know, just family members that I've lost. Um, I had an uncle when I was in high school who passed away from cancer. And I remember the day he passed, you know, we, we got a phone call that morning that, Hey, he's, he's not going to make it through the day. If you want to say goodbye, you need to come now. Yeah. And hospice had been called in and I just remember the hospice nurse there that day. She was amazing. Mm -hmm. Not, not even just for him. Like her focus was on making him comfortable, but I remember her giving my grandmother hugs. Mm -hmm. I remember her, her, you know, holding my aunt just trying to be helpful to everyone. And mm -hmm. I said, it. I'm, I'll say it again. I, thank you for what you do because I mean, it's, it's not an easy thing. Like you said, icky, I mm -hmm. think is, yeah, I think, I think that's something most people, most people would feel comfortable agreeing with is it yeah. feels icky, but it's, it's one of the few things we're all going to do. And yeah, it's nice to know that there are people out like that, like you out there that are willing to, mm -hmm make it smoother, I guess, or make it more yeah. comfortable. I mean, if nothing else, if I can at least forewarn the family or the loved ones a little bit what they're in for, because death is never like the movies. I mean, it can be, but it's rarely like the movies. You know, yeah. it's, it's going to be weird. You know, they're not just going to sigh and go to sleep. That ha I mean, that can happen, but sometimes there's like rapid breathing or pauses in breathing for like, up to 10 minutes and they're really like, Oh, they're gone. And then they breathe again. So it's like, yeah. Yeah, everything's gonna be a little different. And to kind of forewarn people, like you might hear gasping, don't panic. That's, that's the hardest one is not panicking. Cause if you haven't seen it, it's, it's, it's scary, you know, so it's, it's, it's an instinct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's all of our instincts. When you see somebody struggling to live, you want to save them. You want to help them. But yeah. to, to have to hold them back and say, just they're okay. Cause nine times out of 10, if, especially if they're in hospice, they're, they have pain management, you know, they're, yeah. they're, they're not struggling. Yes. They're struggling to breathe, but they themselves are not struggling. This is just part of the process. It's like, yeah. it's like labor on the beginning end of life. You know, if you look at a woman giving birth, it looks terrifying. <laughs> She's screaming and yelling, and you probably know you. You, I had a front row seat to that. Yeah, I was going to say I'm making an assumption here, but I would assume you were present. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's scary. It's it's like, oh God, what is happening? There's fluids and screaming and clutching and yeah, like all these awful things just seem to be going on. That that you know can be a little off putting at the other end of life as well. So yeah. you just have to sit back and say it's part of the process. It's okay. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. And it, you know, it's funny you mentioned the, the giving birth. Cause I, I, earlier today I was thinking about this, you know, getting ready for this interview and just the idea of, okay, you have, I know that there are doulas for births and you know, mm -hmm. doulas for deaths. I mean, I don't care how corny it sounds. It really is a, it just, it shows you just how much of a circle it all is. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I feel like there should just be life doulas because sometimes you need some, well, I mean, there are life coaches, but there are times yeah. in the middle of your life where you're neither being born, well, we're all dying from the minute we're born, but you know what I mean? <laughs> not actively dying yeah. where you just kind of need somebody to hold your hand and get you through it. Yeah. And you, you know, know, and you're, and sometimes it's not even a coach. You're like, okay, this is what you need to do to take your career to the next step. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just, Hey, a mentor. Yeah. It's going to be Thursday's going to suck. Thursday's mm -hmm. going to suck, but we're going to get to Friday. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like that's got to be an untapped market. Life doula. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's, I, I don't know. I, I think that, I think, well, like I said, I think, I think it is very illustrative of the fact that, you know, there is, I don't know, th those are the two things that are guaranteed everybody will experience, being born and unfortunately passing away. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Spoiler alert, everybody, you're going to die one day. Yeah. Sorry. 
<laughs> yeah, and it's it, it feel and it feels icky to say it, you know, but it, it's the truth. And I'll even mm-hmm. say another another reason that I, I do this show is to because my focus has never been just on death, but I mean just on the grieving process in general. And grief can take it can affect us in so many different ways. Mm-hmm. But I I I'll tell you, I have a fear of death. Well, we and, all do, of course we do, because we don't we don't know what's going to happen, you know. Yeah. And then you know it's the thinking about the stuff that's left over afterwards. Yeah. And, you know, the people you care about, what kind of shape do you leave them in? I know. And it's, that's, that to me is the hardest thing because I like, I'm comfortable with knowing I'm going to die one day. Obviously I don't want to right now. I've kind of got some stuff going on, but, but I mean, none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. I I'm in great health, but I could walk out and get hit by a bus, you know, yeah. somebody run a red light. Um, and I, I, that's the fear I have is like, you know, will my husband be okay? Can he manage all this by himself? And what about my cat and my parents? Jesus, they lost their, if, if I go, they've lost both their kids. Yeah. You know, I, it, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to think about. And that's, I think that's the hardest part is just thinking what's, what's going to happen when I'm gone to the people I've left behind. No. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and you're right. There's no, tomorrow's are never guaranteed. That's why I think it's so important. You know, tell the people you love that you love them. Mm-hmm. That's I don't know. I I'm, I literally I, just posted that on Facebook today. <laughs> <laughs> tell tell the people you love you love them and do it now. I, two people I know lost their dads today. Oh. Two separate people lost their dads today, and I'm just like, you have to, life is just too short and too precious to screw around you know if you yeah. love somebody tell them if you want to do something do it because good lord you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow mm. condolences to both of them and their families because yeah. I, I i know that's not easy yeah absolutely when i know this we've kind of we've gone all over the place today um, we really have <laughs> But I, I will say this, I, I've enjoyed it. I know we started heavy and we've kind of stayed heavy the whole time, but you know, Nikki, I've enjoyed speaking with you. Yeah. Um, before we shift into, uh, into wrapping things up, I just want to ask you with your brother, was there anything else you wanted to say about him? Anything else you wanted to tell me about him? Um, I try my hardest to still honor him. Like I said, we fought a lot. We didn't have the best relationship, even in our adult life. We had some issues between the two of us. Um, and I, I absolutely have regrets. You know, I regret not yeah. being more there for him than I could, than I should have been or than I was. Um, and it's too late now. Like I said, this is why I tell people you love them when you can, it's, it's too late. I can't, you know, I can't make it up to him personally, but I can still honor him yeah. either if it's just making the beer cheese every year. <laughs> But uh, I try to do the things he loved to do. My husband and I took up backpacking recently, and that was something he really enjoyed. I still go camping all the time because that was something he really enjoyed. And I feel like in a way I'm honoring him and doing things that he loved to do so that can keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing the things that he would have enjoyed. Absolutely. He would have. My husband and I hiked the Long Trail of Vermont this past summer. Oh, wow. Yeah. And we didn't finish. Sorry. We, but we did like two, we did 180 some miles. Like it was ridiculous. Let's not, um, yeah, let's not sneeze at that. That's pretty no, impressive. No. And we're going to go back and finish this year. Cause I have, I have issues. I got to complete stuff. <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> uh, we only have 91 miles left to go. So we're going to finish that this summer, but I always breathe. feel like yeah. that's something. Yeah. Yeah. And 91. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're old. <laughs> Backpacking is hard when you're old. Okay. We were so much slower than everybody else out there. Um, but I feel like that's something he would have loved to have heard, heard about. Um, mm-hmm. He had a lot of health issues in his life. Um, he had uh, quadruple bypass surgery when he was only 26 after heart attacks. He had mm-hmm. terrible heart disease. Um, and he went into heart failure when he was like about a year before he died. He was diagnosed in, in heart failure. Um so he wouldn't physically have been able to do that stuff anymore. He had a pacemaker put in when he was in his early 30s, I think. So his health just couldn't, he couldn't handle doing any of that stuff anymore. So that's part of why I take such good care of myself, but also why I want to do these things. So it's like, he can't do it, but I can do it, you know? Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you. 
Well, let me ask you this too. I always like to ask my guests this. If you had a chance to have one more meal with him, what would you want to do? What would you want to have? Um, I would want to probably do pork chops over campfire. Obviously with beer cheese, but <laughs> we would have to crack a couple of beers. I'm not a beer drinker, but it's one of those things when I go camping, I got to have a beer. So yeah. Crack, crack a couple of beers, have some pork chops over the campfire and make s'mores. 100%. Yeah. Well, Nikki, I appreciate you coming on. Um, before we wrap up, I would like to yeah. give you some time to promote work you're doing. I know you've got a podcast and you've got a site. I'd love to hear yes. more about it. Yeah. So my website is NikkiTheDeathDoula.com. You can find me there. There's all sorts of information on what I do. There's resources there. I also do grief coaching. Um, that can be done online. So I'm you know, available to help people work through their grief. Uh, I'm very passionate at working with the bereaved. I've had a lot of grief journeys myself. So if I can use that to help somebody else, all the better. Uh, I do have a podcast. It's called Good Grief. And Poor planning on my half uh, behalf. There are a lot of podcasts called Good Grief. So <laughs> if you're looking for it, just type in Good Grief Nikki Smith and it should come up. It's a picture of uh, my red mohawk and my crazy glasses. Uh, yeah. Well, so. I will make sure in the show notes I link to to your site and to the, and to the right Good Grief podcast. I'll make thank sure. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Of course. Well, Nikki, thank you so much for talking with me this evening. I appreciate it. I appreciate you for the work you do and for being so open and honest. And yeah. Thank you for having me. You. I appreciate your podcast and I've been listening to episodes and this is just what you do is so amazing. I love, I love hearing stories from other people. I love hearing, it sounds weird, but I love hearing stories about other people's grief and how they've coped with it. You know, it helps me grow as a person too. And just, but hearing all these amazing stories of these people and their, their love for their yeah. person, whoever their person was that passed is just, it, it touches me in such a, a warm spot. So thank you so much for what you do. Thank you. I'm, I am honored to get to speak to the people I do. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, Nikki, thank you so much. And I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. You too. Thank you to Nikki for joining me today and sharing about her own personal experiences with grief, as well as talking more about the work that she does as a, as a death doula. You know, I, I said it at the beginning of the show, and I'll say it again. I think it's very admirable work to be there to support, you know, people as they are about to pass on and supporting their families. So all respect to Nikki and what she does and, and all those that do that work as well. You can learn more about her and the work that she does at NikkiTheDeathDoula.com, on social media at NikkiTheDeathDoula, or on her podcast, Good Grief. And I'll make sure to link to all of that in the show notes. You can also subscribe to Our Last Mill wherever you're listening to podcasts. I say this every week and I'll say it again. I would love it if you would take the time to rate and review the show just to help other people find it. Um, it does help to you know get those ratings and reviews. Or if you, if you know somebody who you think maybe would be benefiting from hearing this, I would love for you to share it with them. Uh, you can also uh, go on social media and find Our Last Mill Pod. So Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, uh, or go to ourlastmill.com. And there's also a link tree, and I'll put that in the show notes as well. If you'd ever like to be a guest on the podcast, you can reach out by clicking the Share Your Story button at the top of the website or emailing ourlastmillpod at gmail.com or just sending me a message on any social media. With that being said, I'm going to go and wrap it up here. I appreciate you taking the time to listen. And until next time, please take care of yourselves and go share a meal with someone you care about. <laughs>